Hello once again. It's my pleasure to bring you another Freud Simkovich study. This one is undated and it's a most interesting problem. Just taking a look at the position, it really has you wondering what white can do here. This is a white to play and win. And if you look at the position, you can easily see that black's objective here is to play h2 and h1 equals queen and to deliver checkmate in a move or two. At the moment, of course, this bishop here prevents d1 promoting. White's task is to prevent this, of course. Just note in passing that the premise here is not only to prevent black's plan but for white to give up material in order to achieve the desired result the key move yes that is the question well for starters this just does not work for the simple reason that Black would come here, white would have to come here, and then here, and there is just no way that white can prevent one of those pawns from queening and black winning the game. So that is out of the question. So that is the start position. The only possibility that white has here is to play rook e5, which is this. Now, you would think surely that cannot be correct because black can just whip that rook off. But that is the only move. Because, of course, should he play h2, we can withdraw the rook to e1. We'll have a look at d2 as we go through these variations. So, what we'll do here is we'll make this line 1, where black takes the rook off. So, what is white going to do now? Well, quite clearly, this is the idea of giving up the rook. He's heading for e8 to queen it with check. Followed by queen e1. So the queen takes the place of the rook. So in other words, if h2 promotes to a queen check, king moves out the way, queen e1, and white will win this game. And he has other pawns here that he can eventually queen as well. On the other hand, in this position, should the king move out of the way, we queen the pawn. And should he play to d2, we can always play to the h-liner and stop it that way. And give up the queen, like I was saying earlier, give up material, because we can rely on being able to queen one of these pawns. It's as simple as that. So, it doesn't work taking the rook. Nice try, black, but it's not good enough. That's why rook e5 is the key move, yes. What about knight e6? What do we do here? Well, we just take it off. And as can be seen there, there's just no defense because no problem with d2. We can just, we'll just demonstrate it here. If you were to play d2, we'd just come here and we can pick up this. And the bishop, of course, admirably defends against d1. So that, that is not a problem. So knight e6 is no good either. After rook e5, what else does black have? Well, he can play here. He can go to e2. And that's to stop rook e1. So how do we deal with this? Well, white wins immediately because he just plays rook e3. And he's threatening this. And of course, should it go here, then we can go here. Even if the knight goes into g3, like I said, we give up our rook and queen the pawn. Of course, yet again, if he takes the rook, it's e7, and it's a repeat performance of line 1. There's absolutely no problem at all with that. What about d2? This is the obvious move to stop rook e1, of course. He knows he can't queen the pawn here yet because of the bishop. So, how does white deal with d2? Well, what he does is he challenges black at once, take my rook, 
and I'll play e7. So again, like with line one, black can't afford to do that. So what does he do instead? Well, if he plays here, king to c3, yeah. You just play rook e3, check. He has to move the king or interpose the knight. You can whip the pawn off, give the rook up and queen the pawn. So that's no good. And if he goes to d5, you just play this. And then quite simply, if he plays h2, rook f1. So that's that rook to there, and you save the day. So none of those lines works. So what else does he have? That is after white has played rook e5. Just note incidentally here that should black get crafty and take off one of these potentially promoting pawns, don't touch the knight, just play this, your original intention, and you save the day. Because if you take that knight, just look what happens. To stop rook e1, he comes back, but then you cannot stop h1, it's just not possible. So don't do that. So there's just one other line, and it's the only line that really gives black any opportunity here, but it's still not good enough. So that's after rook e5. Can you see what it is? One more line. The clue is we want to stop rook e1, or at least black does. Well, yeah, that, that's right, knight g2, and he's homing in on the square. So how do we deal with that? Well, white has a neat resource. He can play here. Rook takes c5. And what he's saying to black here is, if you take this rook, we'll play c7. And you have the same result on the c line as you had on the e line. So he can't touch that rook. So instead, he plays d2. Yeah, to stop rook c1. That's absolutely correct. So what does white do now? Well, he plays rook c3, doesn't he? Again, take it, c7. And he's threatening rook takes h3. So, what does black do here? Well, he plays knight e3 to stop this. So how does white conclude this game? Congratulations, if you saw it, yeah, he just whipped the knight off. And black has run out of defensive resources after four moves. Again, take the rook e7 and you can stop the h-pawn in time. If he moves it, of course, you just play rook h3, and the bishop is still there to cover that. That is a great problem from uh, Froym Simkovic, and I thoroughly enjoyed looking at this and solving it, and it's my pleasure again to bring it to you. I hope you enjoyed it, and goodbye.